we're recording. All right, so hey everyone, um, excited to see you all today. Um, this is the unveiling of the second volume of our DEIJ toolkit that we've been working diligently on for the past hour, or not hour, year. I wish it was an hour. How nice would that be? Um, but it's been a year of work and now it's time to show you all. So I first wanted to start off with just a little icebreaker in the chat, if I could move around. Oop. Um, and folks can share in the chat, or if you'd like, you can take yourselves off mute just to check in um, since the last time I presented on the toolkits was 12 months ago. Over the past 12 months, what has your organization been up to to further your DEIJ efforts? We'll have folks now in the chat. I'll give um, three or four minutes for you all to type. Hired a consultant to begin dismantling white dominant culture. We spent the last hour making the toolkit. Love it, Rita. <laughs> Ooh, attending DEIJ webinars to keep learning. Ooh, the board is working with staff to form a DEIJ committee. Ooh, finalizing the DEI plan and are working to incorporate it into our work plans. Some more webinar attendance and sending survey to all staff at ANJEC, another board and staff committee, attending webinars, ooh, applying for funding for planning. It's always a big one. Recruiting diverse members for the board. Folks can keep going in the chat if you'd like, so you can share your accomplishments with everyone else who's in attendance, um, but I'm gonna keep moving on. Um, if I could, which would be great. Okay, so for those of you who may not know, this is the second volume of a two-part toolkit. So it, last year, around the same time of year, we released a toolkit focused on internal practices for DEIJ. Um, and these include things like making the case to DEIJ, like to your board or to members or volunteers, a primer on environmental justice, some overview of like governance structures. So incorporating DEIJ into your mission and values, um, a whole like three page list of consultants in the in and around the watershed, um, as well as how to form committees of your own within your organization, which some of you have been doing over the past year. There's information on like internal culture. Um, so and then some like broader topics. So things like tokenizing um, gender and sexuality in the workplace, disability in the workplace. And then it uh, ended with some information on hiring practices. So we made the decision to split the toolkit into like an internal part and an external part for a couple of reasons. Um, and the most prominent reason being um, really informed by this tweet that I had seen as a part of a different webinar that the coalition had shared um, that says, unless the racism is addressed and eradicated in the places you are looking to make diverse, you are simply bringing people of color into violent and unsafe spaces. So if organizations aren't doing the work to change the way that they function internally and are solely focused on external engagement, um, it's very easy for there to be a mismatch um, where really great things are being said and you're attracting different people who may not have um, participated in your organization before, but then once they do start participating and seeing how the organization is functioning internally, it can show that what's being like put outwardly is not the same that's being reflected in like the internal processes. So all that does is really build distrust with the community that you're trying to work with um, and kind of like preemptively sabotages meaningful external engagement. Um, so in the resources that we had seen, and also this is echoed throughout the internal toolkit, we really prioritized 
starting internally, taking the time with like your staff, your board, your volunteers to reiterate like why this work is important to you all, why you're doing it now um, in order to set yourself up for success for external work. Um, another reason that we split it up is because we could get it to you faster. Um, you had a, a year to spend a lot of time, hopefully, with the internal toolkit. I had a year, not an hour, as I said previously, to work on this external part. Um, so resources were able to get to folks a little bit faster in the split up way. Um, so now we can talk about the external toolkit. Um, so this is a broad list of what is included in the um, toolkit. And we're gonna spend some time like for the rest of this session for the most part, going into a couple of like key takeaways from each of the sections just to whet your appetite and get you all excited. Um, but this is all things that your organization is doing like facing outwards. Um, so preparing yourself for community engagement with mapping, principles of community engagement, things like communications, conferences and major events, other um, external programming, things like volunteer procurement, how to advertise events. Um, and then there's some like identity specific resources and information if you wanna do like tailored programming for different identity groups, um, as well as some information for doing DEIJ in rural areas, as well as at the end, some information about community centric fundraising, which might be a new term for some folks, um, but we'll talk about it more. Um, so let's keep it moving. Um, so the we start with an introduction, but an introduction is pretty boring to talk about. So I'm skipping to the next part. Um, and our opening like real section is mapping for engagement. So in the resources that we found, and also uh, talking to our sister coalition, we realized that like getting a truthful assessment about what's happening in the community around you is really important. And one really great way to do this is to leverage maps because then you have that like visual element that makes it easier for folks to understand things often. So the whole like point of the section is to share like uh, ways to ground truth the assumptions that you may or may not be making or about the communities that you're trying to get involved with. Um, and there's a whole host of resources. So um, for folks who are familiar with like ArcGIS and the Esri suite, there's um, resources to the Esri resources um, or links to the Esri resources. There's also interactive maps like per state that each state has made. So you don't need an Esri subscription to interact with those. Um, and then also if you wanna do it old school and paper and pin your map together, you can totally do that as well. We outlined some um, different data sets and ways of like thinking about the maps that you can consider, like what environmental factors are there, some demographic information, things like redlining. Um, we also give um, some resources and guidance on how to use maps to evaluate the strength of your current partnerships. So you can really get to see like the organizational footprint that your organization has had for the past X amount of years, who's really benefiting from the work that you're doing. Um, and then seeing if that is reflective of what you are trying to commit to with diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice. Um, and then one last takeaway from this section is that when you're doing this work, it's largely being done internally, but you could always share and the results and analyze them concurrently with the community that you're trying to engage. Like ask them, is this like factual in the way that you see this? Like, are you looking at the data and interpreting it the same way that we are? Or is there a mismatch there? Um, and that can be like a really good conversation starter. It shows that you've put in the work to like learn about the community and learn about your impacts there um, and can be like the beginning of a broader conversation. Uh, where's my mouse go? Oh, here we go. Um, the next section, and this one's pretty meaty, is the principles of community engagement. Um, so we talk a little bit about like setting your st set staff up for success, making sure that they have like proper training, that they have like flex time, if they have to go to meetings like outside of work, um, and how to like put your best foot forward, which kind of goes into what I was saying before about the internal work being done prior to the external work. Um, and then there's a section about power dynamics. When we're going into new communities as environmental organizations, it's always important to be aware of the power that we're wielding and how that may impact others. Um, so a primer on like concepts of power over versus like power with, um, and then going over visible, hidden and invisible um, structures of power that you can start to pick apart and think about what, how you may be implementing them in your work and how you can share them or 
uh, transition to like a power with dynamic um, with the power that you have. Um, there's also a really great chart that I particularly enjoyed that shows a spectrum of like ignoring a community to deferring to a community and outlines what the different stages look like and that can help act as a roadmap for how your organization may get from one step to the next. There's also a section on how to identify community leaders, like specifically how you, you can find them, as well as um, what sort of things you can talk about when you have identified community leaders. Um, and then there's also a handful of like knowledge gathering questions that you can start when you're working with a community, as well as knowledge gathering activities. So rather than just like a survey, what are some other interactive ways that you can work with a community to get to know their thoughts and feelings about a specific project or program. Um, that section also has a list of common barriers to participation, um, like reasons that people, folks have cited that they are unable to participate in community engagement, as well as um, commonly upper, underrepresented groups in community engagement practices, as well as like specific strategies that can help um, increase the engagement of those underrepresented groups. Um, Towards the end, there's a small section about how to work with like smaller community based organizations, especially if you're like a larger organization and how to work with resources and imbalances that may be present. And then at the end, it just ties up for you don't want to like parachute in and out of communities where it's like I have a project and I'll see you the next time I have a project, but really just reiterating the importance of ongoing engagement and how critical that is to like legitimate relationship building and power sharing. Um, so that is the community engagement section. Um, and then I'm going to toss it over to Rita because she was um, integral in creating the communications section. So take it away, Rita. Hey, everybody. Um, hopefully you don't hear the leaves being cleaned. Apparently now is the prime time for my neighbor's leaf cleaner to clean all the leaves off of their lawn. Um, <laughs> so I'm excited to talk to you today about the, the DEIJ and communication sections of this toolkit. It is really uh, broken up into two different sections online. So things to consider for DEIJ online um, in your communi organizational communications. And then there is a materials and writing section. Um, and these are all just you know, different considerations that um, you know, your organization may want to take into account when you know, moving forward DEIJ externally. So um, first, I'm going to talk a little bit, and I'm going to go kind of quickly through these because this is really what the toolkit is for, and there's a lot more resources in the toolkit. Um, but in the online section of this, in the, in the online section of this, um, first there is um, a little bit of information about um, photos and um, videos, and some considerations there. You're just making sure that. Um, diversity, equity, and inclusion is reflected in any kind of photos or videos um, that your organization um, puts out there. You know, when using stock photos, making sure that it includes um, BIPOC individuals, LGBTQ couples, people of all ages, and other diverse groups. Um, but you also want to make sure that that is the um, audience that um, is actually, that you are um, actually reaching. Um, so it does need to be genuine and preferably, you know, you would use photos that you have on hand from past events. Um, but, you know, sometimes you've got to use those stock photos. So make sure that they are diverse. Um, and then also, you know, when sharing articles online, making sure that the source um, of the article is authentic. So a lot of times, you know, I'll see articles on social media about, you know, um, being trans in the outdoors. So like that should be written by a person who is trans. Um, same thing, you know, if you're posting an article about Black women in nature, that should be written by a Black woman. Um, there's also the opportunity to add pronouns to staff biogra biographies on your organization's website if, you know, staff is comfortable with that. Um, uh, another online um, tactic for making your website um, and more um, accessible to the visually impaired is creating um, captions for any kind of videos that you might have on there. Um, there is also something called alternative text, which is used on websites, but also on social media. And in the DIJ toolkit, you can learn how to optimize your website. There's a link in there um, 
for how you can optimize your website for the visually impaired. Um, so that includes, you know, setting up your website in a certain way, using certain colors, that sort of thing. Um, if your organization is sharing or retweeting posts on social media, you want to make sure that's actually accurate. Um, you know, that the person who is posting that shares the same principles as your organization. Um, there is a lot of, you know, sharing on social media where we don't know what the actual source is. Um, and sometimes it comes from not very reputable sources that you don't want to be associated with. Um, and that kind of just means, you know, just having this kind of consistent voice on social media um, that, there, I mean, there's really no backpedaling. So making sure that, you know, once you post and express your point of view on something, um, that you really stick to it and have that, um, that strong voice and know what your organization stands for. Um, so I know I'm going through this really quick, but again, that's what the DEIJ toolkit is for. Um, so this is all in there along with links to more information. So Kip, if you could go to the next slide, that'd be great. Um, so this is the, the materials and writing section. So you wanna make sure that when you're writing um, written, materials that you kind of have this internal code of ethics. You want to make sure that anything you're writing is prof professional, um, fair, especially when you are talking about, um, you know, communities of color or some other marginalized group. Um, you want to make sure that all your materials are checked for language that can be perceived as biased. There is a lot of unconscious bias um, that comes out when we're writing, you know, whether it's a flyer or um, some kind of recruitment email, what have you. Um, so there's again a link um, to how you can um, learn more about bias-free communications in the toolkit. Um, there's also information about not assuming pronouns when writing about a person or interviewing a person. Um, you always want to make sure as well that you're staying up to date on the correct language to use. So for example, um, some years ago, LGBT was an acceptable acronym. Um, but it's really evolved into LGBTQ+. So that's an example. Um, you know, BIPOC is a, another um, acronym that has become very popular. Um, yeah, and there's just some more tips on in the toolkit on those kinds of considerations. Um, lang language does evolve, and it's important to stay up to date with, you know, what's being used um, and what's the correct terms to use. Um, so when also when addressing a crowd of people, so if you're writing a speech or um, some other kind of written materials, and it includes, you know, um, addressing a whole crowd of people, not saying things like "Good evening, young ladies," and assuming people's gender for an entire entire group, or saying "Hey guys," um, you know, that's really important if you're doing any kind of speech writing. Um, there's also a lot of gender that is kind of worked into our language and a lot of phrases that are gendered. So, and I know most of your organizations probably don't offer pregnancy care, um, but um, instead of advertising, for example, you know, pregnancy care for women, um, advertising it for women and people who can get pregnant um, or pregnant people. So there's again, a link in the toolkit about gender inclusive writing. Uh, and some tips you can learn about that um, so that we can all do better in that area. And then um, also when advertising an event, you know, just advertising, whether it's gonna be inclusive for differently able people, um, specifying, you know, on the flyer, if it's going to be handicap accessible, if there's a sign language interpreter, um, and, you know, if you're doing any kind of movie screening, always making sure that you have the captions on during the film for hard of hearing people. Um, my spouse is hard of hearing, and so I especially put this in there for them because it, this happens to them all the time where they're like in some kind of training and they can never hear what's actually being said in the video. Um, and then um, there's also in the materials and writing section, um, you know, just a little bit of tip on not using African American vernacular English, also known as Black English, on your organizational materials. Um, even if your materials are meant to speak to the black community, uh, it is seen as you know, kind of appropriative. Um, and then, you know, there's also the option if you want to um, really show your support for, you know, LGBTQ people or Black Lives Matter, you always have the option of posting signage or flags um, outside if you have like an actual business office or, a, you know, brick and mortar location. Um, 
there's a lot of ways that you can show that kind of external support. Um, and then my last tip um, is really just making sure that if you if your materials are meant to reach uh, a different kind of um, audience that may not be English speaking, to translate those materials. Uh, and then in the DEIJ toolkit, there is a link to um, what resource media has they put together a multicultural communications best practices. And um, it's really helpful. It's really about kind of choosing the right um, person to be a spokesperson and how to not tokenize them. Um, and I write a little bit about that as well in the press section of this. And just making sure that, you know, when you are making decisions about which stories to share with the press in your materials, really considering all aspects of diversity, including gender and race, ethnicity, um, you know, age, disability status, um, and not tokenizing a, a person. So if you do have somebody in your organization that, you know, is a, a, a diverse um, employee in some way, um, you wanna make sure that you're not tokenizing them. Don't put them in front of a camera to speak to reporters if they have no actual power at your organization. Um, yeah, so I think I'm going to stop it there and pass it on to Kip, who I think has the next slide. But again, I know I went through it really quick, but all of this information is in the toolkit. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. Awesome. Thank you, Rita. Let me find my mouse again. Where are we? Okay, great. Um, so the next section is looking at conferences and major events. Um, and as a note about like the whole toolkit, like not everything fits like very well into one specific section. Like there is a lot of overlap and the conferences and major events section is like the most illustrative of this point. Um, so it goes over a little bit about like demographic surveying for conferences, seeing like who's actually attending and how you can uh, like um, tailor programs um, to specific groups. But that can also be true for like just normal uh, engagement programming, uh, as well as the same for like same principle goes for like land acknowledgements like it's in the conferences and major event section, but it can also be used for a bunch of different ways. Um, so even when you're reading the toolkit for like a very specific thing you're like oh I want to look at conferences and major events, it still makes sense to like take a quick little peruse about what's going out around in the other sections. Um, more specific to conferences though um, it, there's some information about identity-based networking sessions and mentoring sessions though so those can also be standalone programs um, there's some information about how to utilize name tags um, to increase equity and inclusion so that can be like including pronunciation guides on folks's names um, as well as adding pronouns on the um, on the name tags and then there's also like a very um, exhaustive list of disability accessibility um, options for planning conference. So that's like from the beginning of even creating a person who's the disability chair, who is thinking about accessibility throughout the entire conference, all the way through like choosing a venue, planning how the sessions are actually going to run, thinking about how um, folks with various disabilities can like move around and really engage in the work that's being offered. Um, so that's like a very soup to nuts guide. I don't think. Um, oh, yeah. And then at the end um, of that section, there's a little bit about like virtual events and webinars. Um, a lot of the things that are talked about at the prior part of the um, section are applicable to virtual events. Um, but that has like a little bit more specific information for it as well, considering that we're still in this Zoom heavy world. Um, then the next big chunk of the toolkit is about external programming so not like on the same scale of like conferences and major events so we're looking at things like stream cleanups or maybe like birding walks smaller events um, but still really impactful for the folks that attend them um, so there's some information about how to uh, get new uh, diverse volunteers um, as well as how to advertise for events because they use the same sort of venues um, and strategies for folks who attended the microaggressions webinar that we put out in the fall of 2020, I think, um, that entire uh, presentation is rehashed, but like written out in case that, that if that's a better way that you learn, as well as linking to the webinar that we had done. 
There's a section on community science programs, um, which many of you may be more familiar with the like term citizen science programs, so the same thing. Um, in that section, we explain why we choose to use community science rather than citizen science, as well as looking at some case studies throughout the country that have some really useful things that they had gathered um, from doing their community science program that could be implemented if your organization is doing one. There's specific information about programming for youth. So that can look like a couple of resources that are um, promoting equity in activities about the environment. There's also some information about how to like quote unquote retrofit or uh, activities that your organization may already do um, to include more of an environmental justice lens. Um, and then there's also information if your organization has like Rita was saying like a brick and mortar um, place. If you do like a story time with kids or if you even have like a little library, some books about the environment with diverse needs, if that's something that your organization is looking to ex, uh, explore. And then at the end of that section, um, there's just a little bit of a precursor about like identity based programming and what that means um, in that you're creating events specifically for a certain group of people um, to make them feel more welcomed in whatever the event is. And that ties really well into the next major section, um, which is identity specific resources, um, specifically for uh, programming and engagement. So there's four. Um, parts of this section. There's the first part, which is about Black, Indigenous, and people of color, or BIPOC. There's a section about um, bilingual programming. There's a section about programming for disabled folks. And then there's also a section about um, engagement of LGBTQ plus folks. All of these sections go into like a little bit of background or history about why these folks may be left out of the environmental conversations. That's especially prevalent in the BIPOC section. Um, all of these sections, except for the bilingual one, also link to organizations that are identity specific. Um, so like Black Girls Run or Disabled Hikers or um, out, like capital outside um, adventures, which is for LGBTQ plus folks. Um, and then it also has a couple of like resources and best practices for engaging specifically with these communities if, when you're doing programming. Um, um, to answer your question, because I see it now, Tally, um, disabled is the word, and that actually is discussed in the disability section. Um, so folks go back and forth depending on like what group they're in about wanting to use person first language, which is like, I'm a person with disabilities, or um, if they want to use dis, um, identity first language, which means that like they're a disabled person. So the section flips back and forth. Um, in all of these, if you are looking at, um, if you're looking at working with a specific community, you want to like um, echo the language that they use about themselves. So if you're working with a group of folks and you hear them saying like differently abled over and over to describe themselves, then that's the word that you should be using. Um, Sarah, to answer your question where Asian American and Pacific Islanders fit in, there's information about those folks in the Black, Indigenous, and People of Color section. Um, Moving forward, there's also some information about doing DEIJ in rural areas. Um, so that was something that we had gotten a lot of requests of after the first toolkit had been put out. So this reiterates the importance of doing that mapping exercise and also goes over some like broad demographics of rural areas in general. Um, because many times rural areas are like viewed as very homogenous when there is a, still a fair amount of diversity in there just maybe not to the same extent as like an urban core. Um, it also talks about how folks who live in rural areas don't necessarily always have access to nature. It can still be very difficult for them to access like natural areas to recreate in. Um, there's also some tips about communicating um, about environmental justice in like conservative areas where that word may have some like baggage associated with it um, and folks may not um, respond well to that specific terminology. Um, and then there's also a section about how like building trust with extraction reliant communities is important. So if you're going into an area where um, logging is really important to like the local economy, how to um, sell or like send an environmental message without like taking away um, folks' livelihoods. And then 
the last section. Um, it's relatively long on the toolkit, but it's relatively short on the presentation. Um, is community centric fundraising. So this is a concept that's coming out of like the Pacific Northwest um, for like the past couple of years. If folks are familiar with the blog Nonprofit AF, um, then that is where this is coming from. Um, so it goes over the like, common pitfalls of donor centric fundraising, and this is the fundraising uh, scheme most organization nonprofit organizations are using. Um, and it provides like alternatives um, and how like community centric fundraising works, um, centering the needs of the community rather than the donors, um, and how folks can make uh, changes to move more towards the community centric fundraising. One important part about this section is fundraising is important for all of our organizations for us to like be able to do our work. Um, so we don't want to throw like the baby out with the bathwater when we're analyzing the ways that our fundraising may be impacting communities that we serve. Um, so it's really just like a thought exercise and it's like different things that could be implemented um, rather than just like dunking on donor centric fundraising and saying that it's awful. It's just uh, showing where there are weak spots and how community centric approaches um, may be able to address those weak spots. Um, and then this is our last slide. I did want to just let everyone know the like review process and how this whole uh, toolkit came together and thank all the people that needed to be thanked. Um, so CDRW staff um, wrote the toolkit primarily and then also the first round of edits went through the staff. Um, and then the DEIJ work group that the coalition has looked over different sections of the toolkits. All the sections were analyzed by different um, work group members. The toolkit was also shared with the National Wildlife Federation's Equity and Justice Workgroup um, for their review. It also passed through the, the Coalition Steering Committee as well as Resource Media, who we've worked with in the past. Um, and all of that being said, the review process is not done. So you all, um, I think, have the link at this point, and I'll send it out again in the chat and in the notes. I think I'm just going to send an email out to all of our members letting it everyone know that it's live, um, but we do have a member comment period that's open until May 7th. Um, so if there are parts of the toolkit as you're looking through it that you wish were like explained a little bit more, or you wish that there were more examples given, or you're just confused about the way that it was written and you need clarification, comments are open on the Google Doc um, so you can let folks know. And by folks, I do mainly mean me, um, but you can let me know that you have questions about something and I will do my best to like beef up the toolkit in that specific way. Um, so with all of that, that is the presentation that I have. So I'm going to stop sharing. Um, and if folks have questions, we can look in the chat. Oh. I would love it if I could open the chat. Here we go. Um, if folks put questions in like the chat earlier and I didn't get to them, let me know. So, oh yeah, so Sarah's like looking for an example of what a code of ethics looks like. Um, I'm going to defer to Rita for that. Oh, it was answered. Um, yeah, one isn't provided, but it can be internal. Um, so that sort of question is something that like, what I'm going to do at the end of this presentation is so I'm going to copy and paste Rita's comment and put it into the toolkit. And then that's answering your question. You've done it. Yeah, Tally. About the land acquisitions, um, and not acquisitions. Oh my goodness, <laughs> land acknowledgments. Um, I guess I'm just wondering a little bit about those because um, if there's any, like, should you use them if you also, if the content of the conference is also furthering up on that? It seems a little bit, I mean, not tokenism, that's not the right word, but it seems a little bit like disingenuous if you're not addressing um, like those issues or those concerns or though, you know, as, as part of the conference or a webinar theme, then I'm just kind of wondering about it. And I did hear kind of a response from, I should remember her name, but she's a cultural anthropologist with the National Park Service. And she gave a fantastic presentation about um, like, especially indigenous language and, and things like that. And, it, you know, she was just also kind of warning, like be a little careful that it doesn't seem like something you just do because everybody's doing it. 
Um, so I'm just wondering like when it's appropriate to do so and when it just seems like, yeah, we're recognizing that this used to be yours, now it's ours, <laughs> which is a bad way of saying it, but sometimes it feels that way. Yeah, um, so I touch upon that like in the actual toolkit. So making it so you're doing this genuinely and not like because it's slaver of the week and you see other organizations doing it. Um, I also link to the two local Lenape tribes in the watershed. Um, so folks can like donate to them. You can contact them for like speakers if you'd like speakers. Um, but really like it's a good practice to acknowledge um, like the wrongs of the past and have that be something that folks are thinking about. Um, but that should not be the only thing that you're doing to further your connection with indigenous communities. Um, so I think that the, the cultural anthropologist that you um, had referenced and I are like on the same page as that. And I hope that that is reflected as well in the toolkit. Um, but yeah, it should not be like, well, I've done my land acknowledgement, so I'm, I'm good to go. Um, but it is one way of many ways of building inroads and um, being transparent about like how we got to where we are today. Any other questions from folks? I'm going to put the link to the toolkit in here again. And like I said, there's going to be a follow-up email to all of the members, letting them know that uh, the toolkit's out, along with the recording of this and the slide deck. Um, and again, like comments are due May 7th-ish. I love to extend a deadline, but um, I'm going to say May 7th for now. We'll see how it goes. Um, but this is the last call for questions. If you're typing, get your typing fingers going, or you can take yourself off mute. Um, I asked for folks that would like to share this toolkit out to wait until that May 7th deadline, um, just so then it is in its final form. Um, and then after that, feel free to share it like um, if you like it, and as far as you'd like to share it. So, uh, so Kip, I'm sorry, just to clarify that, does that mean that the, the, the actual link to the toolkit will, ch will change by May 7th or just the content? The link will not change. Uh, okay. Yeah. All right, thanks. Um, and then for Rita, where do you suggest organizations start with the toolkit? If you haven't read any of the toolkits, I suggest you start with the internal toolkit. Um, there's a method to my madness in the way that I set it up where like I try to make it this like you can start at the beginning and kind of end at the end. Um, and I know that we're all kind of on our own little squiggly path, but there is a little bit of a method. Um, you can jump around a little bit, but I think like what I was saying before, like the mapping exercises and like doing deep reflection on the impact that your organization has had both in the past and is currently having presently are really important conversations to have um, prior to moving out in the community um, to set yourself up for success. And yeah, the uh, language that Sandra used about uh, land acknowledgements is in the toolkit. All right, folks, feeling good? I am. Oh, yeah. Celebration, Rita. <laughs> okay. Well, if folks have any other questions that, like, maybe you're taking a shower later and you have a brain blast, um, you can email me um, because you all have my email because you registered for this, um, and I'd be happy to do my best to answer it. But thank you, everyone, for hopping on with me today. Thank you again for